Hello, my name's Wilson Herriot. I'm 60 years of age now, and to my surprise, I've been doing ophthalmology since 1980 when I started at the Iron Ear Hospital. I did my medical training at the um, University of Melbourne and came out of the system and wondered what was I going to do with life. I tried to go to the John Colvin lectures that he ran on Saturday mornings for two successive years. And I couldn't stand them, the bugle, everything else. All I knew when I went to, through the exams in medical school was that you had to take a direct ophthalmoscope and if somebody had high blood pressure or headache, use that and look at the disc. So I couldn't stand them on Saturday morning because I'd been selling lollies to make pocket money and everything else. So all of a sudden, I was thinking about what do I want to do? And in the emergency department at Western General, they had a slit lamp. And I started looking at that and looking at the beauty of the iris and everything else. And then there was uh, Martin Brummer was operating when I was doing anaesthetics at Western General and he was doing cataract operation. And it was just a long section, 10 monofilament nylon sutures. And I sort of thought this was just amazingly fantastic. And I said to my wife, became my wife, was my wife, can't remember. Anyway, um, I think I'd like to do ophthalmology after all this because the eye's so small, it's so discreet that you could do your work all day and then just get on and have other interests in life. And all of a sudden, here I am 60 and I'm obsessed and I spend most of my day looking at five or seven millimetres from the disc outwards at the macula and it's 300 to 180 microns thick and that's my life. And people say, what do you do? And that's what I spend my life looking at and I still love it. So what happened was that I was spat out of the system. I thought, well, that's what I want to do. And so I was lucky that I did a year of pathology at Western General as the Western General Registrar. And that gave me some time to study, but it gave me a lifelong passion for pathology and understanding pathologic processes and eye disease. So I went along, and uh, Alan may or may not see this, but I went along to the Iron Ear tutorials and uh, all the trainees there who just got a job and then they sat for the first part even in their third year and uh, they said, what are you doing here? You don't work at the Iron Ear. And I said, well, I thought that if I got my first part, it would make it much more likely that I could get a job in the training program and I want to. And they said, oh, you won't be able to pass because you don't know anything about optics, etc." So I thought optics was important. So I went to Alan Isaac's tutorials and we finished the tutorials just before the first part exam and he lined up and we all went out and he shook my hand and he said, good luck, see you next, next semester. And I said, what do you mean? Don't you think I'm going to pass? And he said, oh, I've only done half the curriculum. So much for getting the optics. Anyway, I did pass, and so I got a job at the Iron Ear. And one of my first jobs was in the uh, university department, uh, what was called uh, MUDO, I think, back then, and the Retinal Investigation Unit and Unit H or something, can't remember, and Jared Croc was the, uh, was the head of the clinic. Now, Jared was just a wonderful mentor. Gerald was a wonderful ophthalmologist and because I'd passed and a lot of people were still trying to get their first part, later in the year I became the, uh, the reliever and then I got to be the um, um, VAU fellow when the guy from India didn't arrive. So I had this wonderful training. Then Gerald tapped me on the shoulder and said, we've got to go to Cook Islands and do a diabetic retinopathy survey with Paul Zimmern. Do you want to come with me? So I had the privilege of going with him to the Cook Islands for three weeks and we surveyed a whole lot of diabetics and published that paper. And so he was, uh, he was a great mentor. And then I said, I want to do retina because I saw both um, Jared and Jim Cairns doing vitrectomies and I saw this world inside the eye and I thought, that's so exciting. That's what I want to do. So the person who was the pioneer of the surgery was Robert McAmer and he was working in the States and I figured that being an Australian, there was no way that I was going to turn up and get this premier fellowship. So I was interested in research and Jared knew Paul Henkine. Now Paul Henkine was regarded as the doyen of medical retinal diseases at the time, along with Alan Bird, but he was more re medical vascular disease and he was the editor of ophthalmology. So Jared said, well I know Paul, I, so I paid for myself to go to New York at the end of my second year and said, I want to do um, medical, I want to do research and then I want to do surgical retina and uh, I want a job. So Paul said, oh look, we can, you can have a research fellowship, there's no money, but um, come along. 
So uh, I was also lucky in my final year to have Dick Galbraith, who was a wonderful mentor and a beautiful surgeon. And Dick took me to the Solomons as part of the team. So that was one of life's great experience doing general ophthalmology. But I was committed to retina. And so uh, I got this job, turned up in New York, and there was no money, so uh, I had the McComas and the Puckle scholarships that Jared had organised, so I had $8,000, so I used to get my cheque every fortnight for $179 and cash that, and by Monday it had all gone. But luckily, my wife had subsidised accommodation from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. So we had accommodation, we had some money that we'd saved before we went, and so it didn't matter that I had an income. So I go and work with Paul, and they didn't have the facilities to look at polymer casting of the uh, retinal vessels, which I'd done some preliminary work on um, rat babies that I used to inject their aorta with this fluid plastic that would then set, and you'd drop their eyes in caustic, and then you'd sort of look at the blood vessels in um, scanning electron microscopy to see how the tunica vasculosis regressed and the tunica lentis disappeared and how the retina vascularised. So they couldn't do that. So then I, th I thought, well, I'll look at using light to injure the pigment epithelium and uh, see what happens. So I did that and I showed that carotid neovascularization occurs because you've got an, an injury on the retinal surface and blood vessels grow through the, the Brooks membrane, which people still don't understand that you don't need a break in Brooks membrane, you simply need an angiogenic stimulus on the retinal side of Brooks membrane and the blood vessels will grow through, just like they grow into the cornea, but it's still um, um, primitive thinking. So that was published, that was good, but also showed pigment epithelial apoptosis uh, that was also uh, not understood but is now extremely exciting because the 2RT laser that Alex are developing and Rob and Gaiman's work um, is uh, showing that pigment epithelial apoptosis occurs just like my stuff back in 1985. So there's a circle completing that here I am at my age getting back into some basic science research in the anatomy department and some clinical trials. So that's a very exciting uh, time of my life. Now, what happened with Paul Hankind is in the second year I continued to do some research and I interviewed with Robert McEmer who, as I said, was the pioneer of vitreoretinal surgery and he was very interested in light toxicity. So he gave me a job as a fellow, two-year fellow. Once again, there was no guaranteed income, but I was passionate about doing it. It was the best fellowship in the States. And uh, so I got that job and luckily, some money appeared that gave me a, uh, uh, a fellowship. So I spent two years there. I looked at pigment epithelial injury by doing vitrectomies in rabbits, causing a retinal detachment, brushing the pigment epithelial cells off and documenting how it, occur how it repaired with, with um, fluorescein angiography in rats. Uh, anybody wants to contact me to find out how to do it, that's easy. Um, uh, and uh, looked at TEM and scanning microscopy and autoradiography of pigment epithelial repair. Now that work is fascinating now because that's what the 2RT laser is doing with the pigment epithelial injury and allowing it to repair. So working with Makama was a very exciting time because he was the guy who had pioneered vitro-retinal surgery. And the sidestep to the story is that, that he had conceived of removing the vitreous and it used to be taboo because during cataract surgery, the vitreous got out, there were risks of retinal detachment, multiple complications. So everybody was worried that removing the vitreous would cause the eye to rot. But a, um, a uh, retinal surgeon at the Bascom Palmer called Krasner, I think, um, had opened up the cornea and pulled out the lens and pulled out vitreous using what they called wex cells. And so the eye survived. But Robert came up with this absolutely extraordinary concept that the pars plana was a space behind the lens that you could insert instruments through and remove the vitreous without having to do it through the cornea. And it was a practical site that you didn't cause a retinal detachment, you didn't cause a cataract, and you could do the surgery. Now that all is commonplace nowadays, but the thing you need to take yourself back to is in the 80s, when I trained, we were doing what was called intracapsular cataract surgery. And to understand Robert's profound conceptual change, 
you have to realise that, that surgery like gallbladder surgery in the old days or appendicectomy when we were all training is a surface approach where you make an incision, hold the wound open and then achieve your surgical goals. And that's what cataract surgery was. You made an incision in the cornea and you exposed the area, you pulled back the iris, put in a cryoprobe and you pulled out the cataract. So it was surface surgery. Still, Robert conceived of three-dimensional surgery where you had controlled pressure chamber, you had an infusion to keep the eye pumped up, and you put instruments in with lighting, and you worked in a three-dimensional space looking down the microscope, and you're working within the cavity, not peering into the cavity. And so people take that for granted now that uh, ortho orth um, um, arthroscopies and laparoscopic surgery for cholecystectomies and that is taken for granted. But Robert took a concept of planar surgery to cavity surgery with remote viewing, but we had the privilege of looking through the cornea and the clear lens. So it was a fundamental change, but there are other changes with his research on the animal models for retinal detachment, the use of triamcinolone, he was the first person to do that, show what was uh, toxic. And he was an extraordinarily creative mind, and so was Jared. But there was an interesting difference between the two because Robert was very mechanically minded and Robert built the first vitrector using a little motor with a blade in a shaft. And the problem was, that because the vitreous has fibres, the motor spinning, grabbing the vitreous gel through the port of the vitrector would ravel up the fibres around the, the shaft as it was spinning and that would pull retinal tears. So he was presenting his preliminary results and Gerard saw this and uh, Jean-Michel, Jean, Jean, I have to cut this out, um, Jean-Marie Perel, um, he, Perel was working with Jared because he'd met him somewhere and gave him a job as an engineer in the university department. So Perel sat down and designed this beautiful instrument called the vitreous infusion cutter and the principle was so elegant. You can't, vitreous is a gel, you can't actually pull it out, you've got a disconnect bit. So they came up with a tube with an opening on the side and vacuum so that you apply vacuum and the gel is herniated through the opening and then a blade came around and swept past and cut that little bit of gel off and then some fluid came in and you could just apply a vacuum and the blade would go around, cut off these little bits of gel and it would progressively remove the vitreous. But not only was it brushing it off, he came up with the idea that if you had a pointed end to the tube, you could have a pointed blade and it would self-sharpen as it span around, the blade would self-sharpen, it would keep cutting away the vitreous progressively. So Makama was then the person who pioneered that. Now, why am I contrasting the two? Well, Jared was a wonderful mentor and a brilliant lateral thinker, but he didn't quite have that linear, sequential, Teutonic, incremental process of spending a number of years developing prototype after prototype after prototype. Jared did corneal graft surgery and vitreous surgery and number of things and Robert was just relentless at unfolding the story with this wonderfully uh, creative mind but a wonderful biomechanical insight and a Teutonic thoroughness. And um, when you said you wanted me to sort of say a few things about these people, one of the things that really sticks in my mind is when I was brushing the pigment epithelium off, we made silicon tips to go on the end of the needle, whereas now they're commercially available for peanuts. We used to have to ream out the, the 20 gauge needle and stick in with some silicon glue and that. But I had cut it down to come to a point so that you could virtually use it like a little shovel to remove the pigment epithelium. And so I'd put down a tapered tip. Now Robert was born in Germany around the time of the Second World War and he'd then come to America and English was not his primary language. But he was totally fluent, perhaps with a slight accent occasionally. But Robert said, uh, the word is, it's cut to a bevel because it's got a slightly flattened edge, not a taper which should be coming to the triangular end. And it was that sort of precision 
of communication and detail that really made him such an outstanding researcher apart from his pathological insights. So I'm the only person, uh, for a long time I think I was the only person outside the US that did a fellowship in VR surgery with the Pioneer, which was Robert McNamara, but I'm certainly the only person, uh, for whatever it means, who had the privilege of working with Jared, of knowing Lubomir Perichik, who was the bioengineer who created the instruments that Jean-Marie Perel designed, uh, with Jared, who was involved in the very early stages, and with Robert McNamara, who pioneered the surgery and carried it through. So I was a very privileged person in the right time at the right place. But when fellows say to me, well, look, you know, there's this job and this, and if I go to the States, I'm not going to get paid. I say, well, what do you want to do with your life? You know, I got paid $179 a fortnight. You're going to earn a lot of money when you, when you get a career. Do what your passion is. And uh, it played out. But there's also a different side of the story, and that is that um, in my second year at, uh, at uh, New York with Paul Henkind, I got the progressive feeling that something was wrong, and that when I talked to him about my research, I had a feeling there was a plateau in the intellectual thing, and he would say, oh, you absorbed that by osmosis, or you did this and that, and I found that the the discussion with him was very flattened and I spoke to a couple of his colleagues and I said, I think there's something strange because for somebody who published 400 papers and is the editor of the journal and this and that, that there's something wrong. And I said, oh, he's always been a bit odd. And I, um, I got the job with Makama based on my light, my, my light injury that Makama wanted that. So I left New York without a reference from Paul Henkine because I thought he had some sort of Alzheimer's. And, and being there with no family, no support, where the chairman of the department is strange, uh, was a very interesting personal challenge of who was saying was it Paul Henkine or was it me? So it made for a very difficult year. And the tragedy was that um, Paul Henkind, after I'd left in the July and about August, September, went internationally to a meeting and was talking about intraocular lenses and started ranting on the stage and was diagnosed with a very aggressive glioma multiforme. So that was one of those life challenges that when you go overseas and you don't have a lot of support, it can be very difficult. Working with Robert was challenged because my mother died while I was there and it was difficult to get away and go and see her. Uh, and Robert displayed a very humanitarian side of support, but it was, you get two weeks annual leave. The fact they were hardly paying me didn't matter, it was two weeks annual leave, and that was it. So when I came back, the disappointment for me in some ways was that um, Jared had retired as the professor, so the university department was in a bit of limbo. The university wasn't interested in um, uh, making any changes until the new professor was appointed, which made it difficult to get traction to do anything. And then, uh, so I increasingly went into some private practice, and um, uh, the idea was very good to me in medical and then surgical retina, etc. But the, the incoming professor at Hugh, I had an interest in epidemiology for diabetes and that, but some of my passion was more basic research and instrument development and that, and that sort of gradually folded as the emphasis became epidemiology. So I think the great joy for me now in Melbourne is seeing what Jonathan has been able to build on the fantastic work that Hugh put in, building up a bigger department and um, providing funding in that, but the joy now is that, is that it's much broader in the skill set and it's a privilege to be back with a sort of appointment that I've got now in, in CIRA's uh, Principal Investigator in VR Surgery and to start doing some uh, animal research in uh, laser techniques for changing retinal detachment surgery and now hopefully with the 2RT laser looking at RPE apoptosis, which when I presented it in Arvo in 1984 and then in 1985 or 86 with John Marshall, these pathologists said there is no such process as apoptosis and I was wrong and the circles come round so the 2RT produces pigment epithelial apoptosis the same as I produced with, with light exposure uh, that was difficult to reproduce and so here I am where some people would be retiring playing golf and all the rest and increasingly committed to doing some more lab research and the joy is that we can do it in Melbourne.